saved in childbearing. Say that with me. She shall be saved in childbearing. So, why don't you stand with me, please? In Psalm 127, the Bible says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. That, that's our key verse this morning. The fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for our joy to be able to study it in this church, this place of worship. Thank you for each one that's chosen to be here this morning. I pray that you would bless them and their families especially. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. On February 7th, we asked the question, does the culture determine the home or does the home determine the culture? And the answer we said depends on who's in charge. The Lord needs to be in charge of the home, except the Lord build the house. So we want to manufacture, model, and multiply godly homes. On February 14th, we said the Lord is in charge, but we are the workers. We are his hands, his heart, his hankering. It's a lifetime process of building a home. We said the Stanley H. Griffin home on 271 Griffin Road was established in 1983, and it is still under construction. We are constantly working at this process, and no one has ever arrived until Jesus comes back, but uh, we are enjoying the process. The Bible says last week we said we talked of the watchman. 1 Peter 5, 8 was our verse, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And so we need to be vigilant as Christians, vigilant in our training and vigilant in our teaching. There is work to be done. John 9, 4, Jesus is speaking, and he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And so obviously we talked about the memorials, the manners, and the mechanics. In other words, the work and keeping your kids busy. And, and uh, if your child is getting in trouble, perhaps he's not busy enough. And there's plenty of jobs that you can do. It takes a little creative thinking. It takes work on your part. But obviously, it, work is not a dirty word. It's not punishment. There's great enjoyment and satisfaction in working and seeing what you've accomplished. And of course, we don't work for our salvation. Salvation's a free gift, but once God's given us something as tremendous as salvation, I think I want to do something for him, and I hope that you do as well. So obviously, Jesus talked about work, and he obviously was a worker. So the worker, the watchman, and this morning, the womb, and this is where I'm nervous. So obviously, I'm real comfortable talking to men about being a man and, and even how to raise your kids. It's a little controversial, but obviously, we, we all have an and I'm comfortable with that. But now we're, we're talking to the ladies this morning, and it just so happens that I am not one. And it's, uh, sometimes we feel like we lack credibility if we try to tell someone how to do something that we've never done before. And so, but the Bible's very clear about some teaching on the woman. In the Garden of Eden, the first family was established, Adam and Eve. And the first command to the man and woman is in Genesis 1, 27 to 28. And God said, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, when the only ones left was the eight people of the family of Noah, that same command again in Genesis 9, 1, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Replenish the earth with what? Trees? Whales? Baby seals? No. Replenish the earth with people. God loves people. 
John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Does God love the, the dirt, the atmosphere? No, God loves people. He loved them so much he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants us to replenish the earth with people. Now, what God loves, Satan hates. Don't miss that. What God loves, Satan hates. In every step of the way, Satan makes an effort to thwart the plans of God. John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. But the first part of that verse, Jesus is saying, he's the one speaking, this is the thief is Satan, comes not but for to steal and kill and destroy. What does he want to do? To God's plan, he wants to steal and kill and destroy it. He has no intention of seeing the Lord be successful in his creation and in every step of the way, ever since day one in the garden when Satan slithered in in the form of a serpent and said, what can't you do around here? He has constantly undermined what God wants to take place. John 10.10 is a great verse for you to memorize if you haven't. Please remember that verse, what Satan wants to do in his attempt to stop God's commands. And how does Satan want to stop God's command? It is obvious that he wants us to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Those are the words of God. How would Satan want to stop that? How would, God, how would Satan thwart God's plan of being fruitful? Well, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And in society today, we have, there's an all-out war on the sexes of man and woman, LGBTQILMLMNOP. All the letters they want to throw up there that want to change society for what it represents and what it means. War on male and female. Planned parenthood is another association that is killing, not helping the American family. I'm not here to be negative this morning, but I want you to see the war that is taking place against a man and a woman wanting to get married and have children. If you will, there is a war on the womb. There's an interesting verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I need you to go there. We're not done in Psalm 127, but... We're going to do a little Bible study this morning, and, and you've got to stick with me on this. Sometimes studying is work. You've got to look over a passage. If you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 1275, 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to do a little bit of an overview of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Micah is teaching 1 Timothy in the men's group on Wednesday nights, 6 o'clock. We have a group of guys come out, there's usually coffee and some treats, and we sit down and open God's Word, and Micah teaches it, and this is a passage that he hit on recently, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I won't take all the time that he did on it, but I want to give you some verses. Now, look at verse number 5 of 1 Timothy 2. And there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. When you need to talk to the Lord... You need to talk to God Almighty, you talk to Jesus Christ. He's the mediator. You don't need to go to the Pope. You don't need to go to confession. You don't need to do any of those things. The mediator is Jesus Christ, and you can talk directly to him. I highly recommend you do that. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Obviously, he gave his life on the cross. And then Paul said, and I love this, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity, or in other words, in faith and truth. And if you will, Paul magnified his office. And I'll tell you what, you ought to magnify your office if you're in Christ. If Jesus Christ lives in your heart, you ought not to be ashamed to say so. I am born again. I am a Christian. Christ is in my heart. He forgave me. He died for me. He loves me, and I love him. Don't be afraid to say those words. Satan would love to silence you on that. So Paul says, as one mediator, and I am 
a witness to that, the importance of Christ. And Paul is a preacher of the truth. And then if you go on down in the passage, we won't go verse by verse, but he talks about the role of men and women. Men are appointed in this passage as the head of the home and the head of the church. I know that's controversial now. There are some, and in fact, is there has to be a head. A German shepherd dog has a head. A fly has a head. Everything has a head. And God appointed that the men would be the head of the home and the head of the church. And Satan loves to make that controversial, and he loves to mess that up. See, whatever God's plan is, remember, Satan is always trying to muddy up the waters. And I will say this, there are some men that are great leaders, and there are some men that are pathetic. Maybe you'd be better off if they didn't lead. There's a good chance, guys, that your wife is smarter than you are. Certainly that case in my home, okay? But that it didn't say whoever the smartest one is in the home be the leader. God said the man is the leader. Even if he's the idiot in the home, he's the leader, okay? Now, I'm not trying to tear men down here, but that's the way God instituted it. It's the way that it is. Now, obviously, if a man recognizes that his wife is better at certain things, for instance, I have decided to let my wife take over the cooking in our home. She's better at it. Now, obviously, I jest. But all of those things you recognize in your home, absolutely, men, as a leader, you get input from those that you lead. Your wife especially, if the kids, if you care to, I don't, can't say that I always ask my kids what they want because I don't know that I want to do what they want. So, but that's another message, I guess. So we'll move on. As you go on through, we've got the head and everything, and, and then he goes on in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and he talks about Adam and Eve and the role that Adam was in charge, and then Eve... And then in verse number 15, the last verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it gives this verse. It says, Notwithstanding, she, the wife, shall be saved in childbearing if they, the husband and wife, continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. Notwithstanding, the wife shall be, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and sobriety. She shall be saved in childbearing. Say that with me. She shall be saved in childbearing. Now, if you've got commentaries at home, go home and look this one up. Newsflash. It won't be in there. That's what's frustrating about commentaries. The really hard questions, they don't help you on. They won't give you the answers to them, that, the ones that aren't controversial. So, this verse has always bugged me a little bit. So, I thought I'd look into a little bit. And I have come up with what I believe the Lord is teaching in this verse. Number one, it doesn't mean she shall gain eternal life by having a child. That doesn't mean that. She shall be saved in childbearing. That's not what that word saved means. It also doesn't mean that she's guaranteed to live through childbirth because the sad part is, you and I have seen it, sometimes a mom will lose her life in giving birth to a child, even in today's modern medicine. It still happens. So, before I tell you what I believe the interpretation is, of, let's look at what we know about childbirth. Number one, only a woman can have a child. Oh, <gasps> shocker. The term woman is derived from the combination of womb and man. Woman. A man does not have a womb, nor does he want one. Okay? Number one, only a woman can have a child. Number two, a woman has a God-given desire to have children. This is and has been under attack since the beginning of time. There's more that we could say about that. But a woman has a desire to have children. Genesis, there's some great instances of this. I love this stuff. Genesis 30 and verse 1, Jacob has two wives. That's not a good idea, okay? Rachel and Leah. Leah was having children and Rachel was not. It was driving Rachel crazy. Rachel says in Genesis 31, and when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children... Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Now, guys, that's rich. 
Because I'll tell you, we have no control over that thing. And like, I don't know how personal I should get with this stuff, but it's in my notes. So let me read ahead. You can talk amongst yourselves. Let me. Um, so I think I've shared this before. Uh, Emily and I got married, and uh, Phil, my son, happens to be here today, and Tori, who was not, and they were young, and I told Emily, I've had children, that ship has sailed. You get two kids when you marry me, and you get me. So, <laughs> what, as in, I, 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 before I finish, I love, I love what, uh, Hannah wanted kids so bad when she couldn't have Samuel. And Elkanah, her husband, looks at her and he says to her, am I not better than 10 sons? And I'm thinking, that's pretty much what my attitude was, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so, but obviously, when a woman wants a child, she wants a child, period. Okay, so I obviously Emily and I dated. Well, I got two kids. They're wonderful. The kids love Emily. Emily loves the kids. Voila. Problem solved. Until we got married, and I'm watching her look at her sisters holding babies. And I think, oh, uh, this isn't good. Okay. <laughs> there is something in a woman that desires to have children. Number two, that's number two. Number three, once they have children, she is desired. Now, she has a desire to have them. Once she has kids, now she is desired, not by her husband, but by her kids. That there are times, and I can remember this, that when there are certain situations in life, the last thing I want is my father. I want mama. Mama is the one that takes care of all of the she teaches, she kisses, she rescues, she raises, sometimes she spanks, but there's a love that mama provides that the kids want from mama that we're not looking for from dad. We want that from mom. So number one, obviously only a woman can have children. Number two, she desires to have children. Number three, she now after she has children, she is desired. Number four, they become the defenders. Psalm 127 says they will speak with the enemies in the gates. And I'll tell you what, even when I was very little, incapable of winning a fight, I'm looking at some kids in the room right now that, that are very young. And I'll tell you what, you wouldn't want to pick on their mama. No chance. And, I would try, and now here I am as a senior adult. Thankfully, my mom is still with me. You wouldn't dare to touch my mother if I was around. For that matter, you wouldn't dare to touch any part of our family. God puts that in us, that, yeah, we'll speak with the enemies in the gates. No problem, because that's put in us. God made us that way, and it happens through family. Even the mafia, a bunch of killing, thieving low life that all ought to go to jail. What do they talk about? You don't touch the family. You don't mess with the family. You know? Really? Because it is. It's the way that God made us. They become the defenders. And lastly, number five, they determine the future, the children, the young people, the ones that we're trying to raise, that came through mama's womb. The only way they can come into the world is through a female. They determine the future of the family, the church, and the nation. Why do you think Satan hates kids? Why do you think Satan is trying to mess up the plan of the home? Because that is the future of the society. And that's what God put in place, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So... She shall be saved in childbirth. It's not eternal life. And it's not a guarantee that she won't get sick. I'm, I'm, and I'm going to get this in. There is a Greek word that is used in the word saved 
It's used over a hundred times in the New Testament. It's spelled S-O-Z-O. We would say if it was Bozo the Clown, we'd say Bozo or Sozo, but the Greek word is not pronounced that way. It's Sozo. S-O-D-Z-O is how we would pronounce it if you were going to speak the word Sozo. It's Sozo. Say that with me. Sozo. So now you know a Greek word. You're, you have, when you go home, what you learn today? Learn some Greek. Okay? Will that change your life? No. But anyway. So sozo can be, di- be interpreted different ways. And I'll give you some instances of this. Remember, it's used over 100 times. We won't give them all. In most cases, it is, in, it is pr- um, interpreted save or saved in most cases. But it's also interpreted some other ways. Matthew 9, 21. For she said within herself, if I might, might touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. Sozo. Whole. Matthew 9, 22. But Jesus turned about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good cheer. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole. Both of those cases, made thee whole and made whole. Sozo, sozo, from that hour. Mark 5, 23, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth in the point of death, I pray thee. Come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be sozo, may be healed. And she shall live. John 11, 11, speaking of Lazarus, do well, sozo. 2 Timothy 4, 18, preserve, sozo. So here we are. Here's some verses of the same word, save, saved, made whole, do well, preserve. All the same Greek word, sozo. Now look at the verse. 1 Timothy 2.15, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. Notwithstanding, she shall be made whole in childbearing. Notwithstanding, she shall do well in childbearing. Notwithstanding, she shall be preserved in childbearing. All of those are the same word. If we plugged them in and used them there, I'm not saying it was rendered incorrectly saved. Is that I will never correct the King James Version of God's word. I would never do that. But I am saying I believe that that verse could be interpreted as the fact that when a woman has a child, it completes her. She recognized that she's fulfilled a role that God gave her that no one else can do but her. No man can do it. No one else. There is a time in your life, ladies, where God gives you the ability to have children. And if you buy into the line, I'm not saying you're sinning if you don't have kids. That is not what I'm saying. Don't go there. But I am telling you this. If you think there is a greater purpose in your life, in business, in other pursuits, or whatever, than bearing children, you are giving up an ability that no one else can do. If women don't have children, there won't be any. If we kill every child in the womb, there won't be any. If we decide that the sexes, male and female, don't matter, there won't be any kids. You see, every lie, everything that Satan does to come in, what's he trying to do? He's trying to keep the next generation from ever happening. What a disaster. This week, I know you don't like me talking about politics, but it's part of our life. This week, we passed in the house a a new an attachment to the Equal Rights Amendment that gives transgenders and whatever other twisted form of a human being we can develop to give them equal rights with anyone else. And it's going to devastate female sports. It's going to tell us that even a church has to hire someone that was born a male but thinks they're a female. All of that twisted garbage out there that's going on that Satan is trying to shovel like manure into our society, and we're not allowed to say that is wrong. Well, mark it down. Stan Griffin at the Cornerstone Baptist Church says that's wrong, okay? But more than that, there was a gentleman that stood up in the, from Florida, reading from God's Word, talked about how that is wrong, and that's not what God intended, And then Jerry Nadler from New York stood up, and he said, we do not care what God's will is in this assembly. Can you imagine? Well, sad to say, that pretty much is the attitude of America today. We don't care what God's will is. 
in this assembly. Well, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't be going out to eat with Jerry Nadler. I wouldn't be driving in the car with Jerry Nadler. I wouldn't be in the same room with Jerry Nadler, because who knows? Just when Jerry Nadler's life, you know, I'll tell you what, I still believe God strikes people dead. I still believe that. Now, whether he will or not, there's a lot of people I think should have been struck dead that haven't been. (laughs) But I shouldn't have said that. But I'll tell you what, it ought to concern us that when we know what God's plan is for society and we come up with some other form that we think is better, then that is wrong. I am thrilled that the Bible says that the fruit of the womb is his reward. We're out of time, and I'll close with this, that what I said said to say in the year 2021 is controversial. And it, 100 years ago, this was not a controversial message. Maybe in 50 years ago, it wasn't a controversial message, but it is in 2021. But you ask a woman that has had children, what is your greatest purpose? What is your greatest accomplishment in life? And guys, I bet you nine out of ten times, it's going to be the children that they brought into the world. And I don't completely understand that because, guys, we can't do that. God, there is a difference between men and women. There is a difference in understanding. But I'll tell you what, just consider this. Male or female, whoever you are, God laid down a plan for your life. You were made on purpose for a purpose. And let me challenge you this morning to find the purpose God has for you and live it out. And I promise you, it will be the most satisfying life that you can possibly dream of. Will you be rich? Will you be famous? I don't know any of the details, but I do know this, that I have found that living for Jesus Christ, making him my Lord and Savior, having him live in me, be my friend that sticks closer than a brother, I can promise you that he is the most satisfying endeavor that you can possibly find yourself in. And if you've not trusted him as your Lord and Savior by saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive my sins, and be my Savior, let me tell you something. You are missing the greatest pleasure in all the world is a relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing that your sins are forgiven, that you have a home in heaven, and when you leave this world, you've just started living. Heavenly Father, we love you. I hope this message has made sense. Thank you for the plan that you have for our lives. We love you. We believe in you. We do not believe that your commands take away from the quality of life. We believe that your commands add to the quality of life, and you have truly blessed us. Lord, I love you. I'm so glad you're my Savior. I pray for every person that's here this morning that I hope that at some point in their life they have said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be my Savior, and forgive my sins. If they've not done that, then I pray they would right now. Lord, I pray for that woman that is wanting to have kids and has not been able to, that you would bless her with children if it's your will. Lord, I pray for that woman that, that perhaps had children and it didn't go as well as she thought, and now maybe her children are wayward. I pray that you would touch her life and pray for her kids and that 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 child would, would be what you planned for. Lord, not everything comes out perfect, but the least we can do is just do what you ask from us, that a man would be a man and that a woman would be a woman and we would fulfill the roles that you have for us, whatever they may be. Lord, I am not the voice of the Holy Spirit. I do not know the plan for every person in this room, but you do. And I pray that you would reveal that to each one as they seek your face and try to follow you. Lord, we'll open the altar. We'll give folks a chance to respond. Whatever you want from us, however you've spoken to us this morning, I pray that folks would respond in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.